Hey everybody, welcome to Always Bored, Never Boring. We are playing Warhammer Quest Cursed City again. This is a follow-up to my previous playthroughs, so we have our same team of heroes going off on an adventure. This time they are doing a hunt scenario, where they will be going into the streets of Ulfenkarn and just trying to kill as many champions as possible to minimise Radukar's influence over the civilians. When you play a hunt scenario, you roll on a chart to see which arena you will be fighting over, and we have arrived at the barracks. I've already set everything up here. The only difference in the layout here compared to the layout in the quest book is I have repositioned our starting tiles slightly, just to make it a little bit easier for me to get everything into shot. But we are almost ready to go. The last thing we have to do, and I wanted to do this on camera, is spawn the starting monsters. There are four mysterious objects on the board, so we will draw four encounter cards. And each encounter card will spawn some monsters next to one of those objects. Our first encounter will be three Deadwalker zombies. And that's not ideal for us because there are no champions in Deadwalker zombie groups. We are basically looking for named villains, vampires, Kosagi night guard, Ulfenwatch Sergeants, Dire Bats, and Blood Rats. Our second group, we have another two Deadwalker Zombies. They will go on the second closest object. Our third encounter is Gorslav the Gravekeeper. This is a really interesting turn of events. Gorslav can be more of a concern when there are lots of zombies on the board. He goes up there. And our final encounter group is three Corpse Rats. So there we go, our barracks are set up and ready for the first turn of the game. Our objective here is kill 10 champions. Once we have done that, we need to get to the extraction point, which is the closed door in the top left of the board. At the moment, Gorslav will grant us a victory point, and so will the Blood Rat. Everything else we just need to get rid of because it's a nuisance. And I'm not going to go into any more rules explanations at this point, I will explain things as we go. But we go into our first turn, and the first thing we have to do is advance the Sun Tracker. When that Sun Tracker eventually reaches a night spot, all of the enemies on the board become more powerful. Next we have the quest step, but in a hunt adventure there is no specific instructions for quest steps so we skip it. Next we have our destiny phase where we will roll a set of five dice which will serve as a common pool of extra activation dice that our heroes can use throughout the turn. We have rolled two ones, a two, a three and a five. With destiny dice you have to discard any duplicates, so those ones are removed but we still get a 2, a 3, and a 5 that we can use. Next we have the initiative phase, where we start by rolling activation dice for all of our heroes. Each hero starts with 4d6, but they will lose those as they take wounds. I will roll them off camera, but I will show you what dice are available to each hero as they activate. The next step is the initiative step, where we will deal out the 8 initiative cards, 4 for our heroes and 4 for the groups of adversaries. But just before we do that, Cleona Zeitingale wants to take advantage of an ability she has. She has a special path to glory rule that allows her to discard a dice with the same value as dice discarded from the destiny roll, and that every dice she discards is equal to one inspiration point. One of her dice in her activation roll turned up as a one, and because we discarded ones from the destiny roll, we are going to discard this to gain an inspiration point immediately, because gaining inspiration points is really important. Next, we will shuffle these initiative cards and lay them out on the initiative track to determine the order in which everyone will activate. And our starting initiative order will be Jelson Darek, followed by Cleona Zeitingale, then the second group of Deadwalker Zombies, then the first group of Deadwalker Zombies, then Captain Braskov, then Gorslav, then the Rats, and finally Dagnai Holdenstock. Once you've laid out the initiative cards, you have a gambit step. Heroes, if they want to, can roll an agility test, and if they're successful, they have options for repositioning their card on the initiative track. I don't want to do any gambit rolls at the moment. I'm relatively happy with that order, and I want to save my dice for actions. However, Imelda Braskov does have an ability that allows her to swap places with another hero on the track as a free action. And I do want to do that. I want to swap places with Cleona Zeitingale because I would rather get Braskov into the fight early. With that done, it's time to start our first turn of activations. And Jelson Darek goes first. Jelson is our vampire hunter. I will place his card up in that top corner for now because it's out of the way. Now, the dice on his character card can be used for actions but the actions available depend on the value of the dice. For example, a dice with a value of one or more can be used to move, while a dice with a value of three or more can be used to run. Your most powerful abilities require dice with the highest values. But I'm going to start this activation by using one of our destiny dice. I'm going to use a destiny dice with a value of three in order to run, and that allows me to move four squares. 
And we have moved adjacent to this door, the reason being in this game, if you are standing adjacent to a door, you can see everything in the room beyond. So we now have line of sight to all of these zombies, and Jelson Darek has a judgement rifle. If he discards a dice with a value of 5 or more, he can shoot that rifle, and we have a pretty good chance of killing a zombie straight away. So we discard our dice with a value of 6, and on our character card it tells us that when we use the judgement rifle, we are rolling two of the special 8 sided combat dice. And we have rolled two successes there. No matter how many dice you roll for an attack like this, you only pick one result. And a success with the Judgment Rifle inflicts two wounds. If we look at the Dead Walker zombies here, we can see that they have a total of three wounds. So we have not killed the zombie, but we did injure it. However, Jelson has a special ability called Ruthless. Each time he is successful in an attack, but the target does not die, he gets to make a follow-up attack with his firewood stakes. He gets to roll one of the six-sided combat dice. On a success, he inflicts another wound, and that would kill the zombie. Alas, we do not, but two wounds on the first zombie, not a bad start. Next, we are going to use one of our dice with a value of two to move into the room. I'm going to move to there. As soon as you step on a space adjacent to an enemy, you have to stop moving. I could spend another dice to continue my move, but again, if I stand adjacent to a monster during that move, I have to stop again. So trying to move around when there are monsters can really drain your activation dice quickly. Fortunately, it's okay. I only want to go this far because I have an adamant blade, which I'm now going to hit this wounded zombie with. I discard a dice with a value of one or more, and this attack allows me to roll the red 12-sided combat dice. And that's a critical success. A critical success with my sword inflicts three wounds. So actually, if I'd have attacked the zombie that wasn't injured, I would have killed it outright. Unfortunately, I specified I was attacking the injured one, so we remove the injured zombie from play. When you remove an enemy from play, you place it on the encounter card for the group they came from. We still have a dice with a value of 4, so we are going to make another attack with our Adamant Blade. And it's another critical hit. That's another 3 wounds, that's another dead zombie. This has been a really good start for us. Jelson is out of activation dice now. If he wanted to, he could use another Destiny dice because each hero is allowed to use up to 2. But I think for the moment, we're going to leave it at that. So the last thing we have to do on Jelson's activation is check for inspiration. He killed two zombies. Each zombie had three wounds, which gives us a total of six. We now roll a d12. If we roll a six or less, we gain an inspiration point. And we roll a one, so we do get an inspiration point. This really has been a good start. Next up is Braskov because she swapped places with Cleona in the initiative track. And we are going to start by discarding a dice with a value of 2 to move, and we can move 3 spaces. We are then going to discard a destiny dice with a value of 2 to move again. She is now adjacent to a zombie, so we can discard a dice with a value of 1 or more in order to make an attack with our Dawnlight Sword. We will use our dice with a value of 3 for that. Unfortunately, we have missed. But it's not the end of the world, we have more dice. We're going to discard a dice with a value of 4 to try again. And it's another miss. This is really bad. We are going to use our dice with a value of 6 to attack again. And this time it is a critical hit. That inflicts 4 wounds and kills the zombie. For a moment there, starting to worry. So that will end Braskov's turn, apart from rolling for inspiration. A 3 or less will grant us an inspiration point. And we roll with an 11. I'm not surprised. Braskov did not have a good turn. Next up on the track, we have Encounter Group 2. That is the group of two zombies in the top left of the board. Now here is how activations work for monster groups. When they activate, you first check their encounter card to see how many slain enemies are on that card. There are currently no slain enemies on the encounter card. If there were slain enemies, you have to check how many enemies are still on the board. And if the total number still on the board is a third or less of the original encounter group size, then they have been driven off. In that situation, every enemy still on the board from that group will make an attack action, and then you remove them from the board. You then remove their encounter card from the track and replace it with a face down encounter card. Next turn, when that group activates, you flip the encounter card face up and you spawn the enemies listed on the card. 
I found that that process does not generate enemies at a quick enough rate to keep me engaged in what's going on. So I do things a little bit differently. Every time an encounter group activates, I activate them normally regardless of how many enemies are on the board. And then I check for being driven off at the end of the turn after everybody is activated. That is a house rule, some people won't like it. But for this playthrough, I am going to use my house rules. I hope that's okay with everybody. I know some people would rather see the game being played rules as written, but honestly, I think we will have a more exciting playthrough if we do it this way. But that's by the by at the moment, we need to activate this group of two dead walkers. So we roll a D12 and we consult their behavior table. We have rolled an 11. Impaling Curse Briar. Each acting hostile makes an advance action. If a hero suffers damage from that advance action, they are trapped. This could have been bad for us if the zombies had been closer. As it is, it's not a problem because zombies only move two spaces. So these zombies aren't going to get anywhere near us. That completes their activation, so we go next in the initiative order. That would be zombie group one. They are dead. As the entire group has been wiped out, under the normal rules of play, we would now remove that encounter card from the track and place a new encounter card face down. But because we are playing with my house rule, we'll do that at the end of the turn. Next to activate is Cleona Zeitingale. Cleona only has three dice because she discarded one to gain an inspiration point. She is going to use a dice with a value of three to run. She will then use a dice with a value of two to move. She will then use her dice with a value of five to use her Heaven's Bolt stilettos on one of the zombies in the next room. If it hits, it only does one point of damage, but it does stun the zombie, which means the zombie will not activate on its next turn. And we roll a critical success. So that's one wound on the zombie and it is stunned. So we have to lie it down on the board. And that's all we can do. We could use our last Destiny dice to try and use Heaven's Bolt stilettos on the other zombie, but Dagnai Holdenstock wants that dice because he wants to use his harpoon gun this turn. Cleona did not kill any enemies, so there's no inspiration roll for her. Instead, it's time to activate group three. That's Gorslav. We have rolled a four, and we have rolled Arise, Arise. Deploy all slain Deadwalker zombies from hostile groups as reinforcements. This hostile and all Deadwalker zombies on the battlefield make an advance action. So there's a few things to note here. First of all, under the rules as written, the group of three zombies that we have already killed would have been removed from the initiative track by this point, because remember, when they activate, if they have been driven off, you remove their card and you place a new card face down. That means those zombies would not get to respawn because of Gorslav's Arise Arise ability. However, because I check for driven off at the end of the turn, those zombies are still on the track right now, which means they can indeed respawn. This is just one of the ways in which checking for being driven off at the end of the round can affect how enemies turn up on the battlefield. So worth bearing in mind, Gorslav's action here would have been a lot tamer if we had been playing by the rules as written. But as it is, these three zombies are going to return. Which leads me to another minor adjustment that I make over the rules as written. Normally, you would spawn reinforcements at the furthest lich gate from where the heroes are standing, which would put the very slow moving zombies right up in the top right corner of the board, where I really wouldn't have to worry about them for quite a few turns. But I actually randomize where the reinforcements come in from. There are six lich gates on the board and I give them each a numerical value. Top left would be one to two, top middle, three to four, top right, five to six, bottom right, seven to eight, bottom left, nine to 10, and the central lich gate would be 11 or 12. I then roll the dice and all of the enemies will spawn adjacent to the lich gate that I have rolled. They are turning up at spot 11. Spot 11, you may have noticed, is right in the middle of the board. When reinforcements arrive, they each take an advance action and an advance action is a move followed by an attack. Fortunately, none of my heroes are within two spaces of that lich gate. But we will spawn each zombie and move them two spaces. But of course, that was just the first part of Arise Arise. Now, Gorslav and every zombie on the board will make another advance action. First we'll move Gorslav, he moves three spaces. Next, we will activate the zombies in the left chamber. The one that is stunned just stands up. The other one advances two spaces. 
and that does create a small problem for Cleona Zeitingale because that zombie is now adjacent to her, so will attack. We can see they attack with a d8, but it's a miss. And now all of the zombies that just respawned advance again as well. I'm going to move them all in first and then we'll roll for all their attacks together. So it's 1d8 for each of them. Two misses. Three misses. Zombies are rubbish. Well, that was a bit stressful, but things have ended up okay-ish. The problem now is the corpse rats get to activate too. We are getting bundled. We have rolled a one. Looking at the corpse rat's behavior chart, it says a roll of one to seven will heal all wounds on all of the corpse rats, and then they will make an advance action. And they move three spaces when they make an advance action. It's time for Dagni to activate. Dagni is going to use a one to move, which means we can pop him there. He now has line of sight to all of the zombies in that room. He's then going to use a dice with a value of two to move again, which gets him to there. We're going to discard a dice with a value of two to attack the zombie that previously attacked Cleona. We're using our axe for this, so we roll a red d12 combat dice. That's a strike that inflicts two wounds, not enough to kill the zombie. So we will use our dice with a value of three to strike it again. That's a critical hit, that's three wounds, that kills that zombie. We have one destiny dice left, it has a value of five. Because we are adjacent to enemies, we cannot use our ranged weapons, so we're just going to attack another one of the zombies with our axe. If we get a critical strike, we will kill one outright, that's what we really need now. But it's only a regular strike, that's two wounds on the zombie, not enough to kill it. Dagni rolls for initiative, three or less will get him an inspiration point. He rolls a one, he gets an inspiration point, that's amazing. All of the activations are over, so now we roll for an event. We have rolled, our time grows short, we have to advance the day tracker by one space, bringing us closer to nightfall and the point when the enemies get tougher to kill. And that's the end of turn one. It's been a bit of a shower so far. New turn starts by advancing the Sun Tracker again, rolling Destiny dice. We have to discard those ones and those fives. We only have a single Destiny dice to use this turn. That is bad. We have a lot to do and not a lot of dice to do it. We will then roll our activation dice and set up the initiative track. And it's not great, but it's not terrible either. Jelson will start, then Braskov, then that big group of zombies in the middle of the board, then Cleona, then the injured zombie over on the left, then Dagni, then the rats, and then Gorslav right at the very end. Cleona is once again going to discard a dice with a value of one to gain an inspiration point. We're not going to do any gambits, we're not going to make any agility rolls to adjust the track, but Braskov is going to swap places with Jelson Darek, so she will activate first. She's had a good activation roll and has a good chance that she can kill some of these zombies. And we're going to start the turn by discarding a dice with a value of six in order to play Death Blow. This allows us to pick two enemies that are in the same space or in adjacent spaces, and we get to attack them both. We are going to target the two zombies that are just to the north of us. We're going to start by attacking the one that is injured, and then we'll do a second attack on the one that isn't injured. Any success will do for this first one. It's a miss. Never mind. Second attack on the uninjured zombie. That's a critical hit. That's four points of damage. That kills a zombie outright. Unfortunately, we can only perform death blow once per turn. But we can carry on hitting stuff with our sword anyway. So we're going to discard a dice with a value of one in order to attack the injured zombie. That's a success. That's two wounds. That's another dead zombie. We now discard our dice with a value of five to attack the next zombie. That's another critical hit, that's another four wounds, that's another dead zombie. That's three kills for Braskov, and that's really good for her, I will explain why in a moment. We have one activation dice left, and the problem with Braskov is she doesn't have ranged attacks. Furthermore, she doesn't have line of sight to anything anyway. Now we could save that dice with a value of six, it would downgrade to a five and it would become a reaction dice. And then if anything gets into base contact with us at any point, we can spend that dice to make an attack against it. But I'm going to do something different. I'm going to use the six to search the object of interest that's next to me. That means we draw the top discovery card. And we have found a realm stone, that's very useful. 
and now we have searched the mysterious object, it is removed from play. That completes Braskov's turn. But good things have happened, because if you look at Braskov's path to glory, it says each time this hero slays three or more hostiles during the same activation, gain one inspiration point. We killed three zombies, that means we get an inspiration point. Furthermore, we still get to roll for inspiration, and a nine or less will grant us a second inspiration point. And we roll an eight, that's two inspiration points for Braskov. A really good turn. Unfortunately, we still haven't got any victory points yet because we haven't killed any champions. Let's see if Jelson Darek can do something about that. Jelson Darek does not have line of sight to use his gun, but we are going to be brave, we are going to be bold, we are going to go and instigate a combat with Gorslav because we want to remove him from the board before he has a chance to revive all these zombies. So I'm going to start by discarding the only destiny dice we have, which has a value of three, and that will allow Jelson to run four spaces. And now we're just going to start wailing on Gorslav with our sword. Looking for lots of critical successes here. And that is a critical success. That's three wounds on Gorslav. Gorslav has nine wounds, so we're a third of the way there. Let's hit him again. It's another critical hit. That's six points of damage. We go again. That's insane. That's three for three. That's another critical hit. And Gorslav dies. That's unbelievable. Swapping Braskov to the start of the activation track and letting her clear out the zombies first has really worked in our favour there because Gorslav is removed from the board and he will no longer be able to regenerate any of those dead zombies. Furthermore, Gorslav is a champion and that grants us our first victory point. Jelson has one dice left. We are going to downgrade it to a reaction dice with a value of four and end his turn. But now we have to do the inspiration check and this is really good. Jelson already had an inspiration point. He has a special path to glory ability called Relentless Hunter, which says every time he slays a champion, he gains one inspiration point. Gorslav is a champion, so that takes us to two. Furthermore, we still get to roll, and Gorslav had nine wounds, so a roll of nine or less will grant us our third inspiration point, and we will inspire. And it's a 10! So near and yet so far, we were doing so well. Never mind, I think next turn we'll get it. Next to activate would be group one of the zombies, and they have been wiped out. As I've mentioned before, normally in this situation, rules as written, we would remove their encounter card from the track and place a new encounter card face down at this point, but we will do that at the end of the round. Next, Cleona will activate. And the first thing she's going to do is discard a dice with a value of four to use Heaven's Bolt Stilettos on that injured zombie. If we can inflict a wound, they will be stunned and we don't have to worry about them for another round. And it's a critical hit. That's another wound and they are stunned. Awesome crowd control from Cleona. She has two dice left and not a lot to do with it. She needs a dice with a value of four or more in order to use Heaven's Bolt Stilettos. So we can't go and target any of those rats. Furthermore, we don't want to get funneled into a narrow corridor with Cleona and have the rats attacking us because that's not good times for us. Cleona is a bit squishy. We could, if we wanted to, move over to the stunned zombie and hit it with our thrice blessed mace, which could kill it. The downside there is if we do kill it, then a new group of enemies will come into the board next turn. I would rather have that zombie just waste its turn standing up. It's a bit of a tactical ploy to keep it on the board and minimise the number of reinforcements that are going to come in. So I think Cleona may as well just stay exactly where she is and see what happens next turn. Next up to activate is our injured zombie. They just stand up and then Dagni activates. Dagnai is my tank. I'm relying on him to block up the access route for these rats so that they can't get to me. So I will spend a dice with a value of two to move. I will then use my dice with a value of four to use my harpoon gun. And I'm going to use it on the blood rat. That's the big boss rat. And it's a critical hit that does three points of damage on the blood rat. Corpse rats normally have three wounds, but the blood rat is a champion, so it gets a bonus fourth wound, so it's not dead, and that means I get to reel it in. A successful strike with my harpoon gun allows me to drag the target up to three spaces closer. So of course, I'm going to drag the blood rat into the space adjacent to me, so I can hit it with me axe. We'll use our dice with a value of two for this. Any success will do. And there it is, that's a success, that's two wounds, the blood rat is killed, and that is another dead champion, which means we will get another victory point for that. 
I have one dice left, I'm going to downgrade it to a reaction dice with a value of two. Well, that has all gone exceedingly well. It's now time to activate group four, that is the corpse rats. They rolled a two. They remove all their wounds and then they make an advance action. That means Dagni has to face one attack. Rats roll the d6 combat dice. And it's a miss. That ends that. The final group would be Gorslav, but Gorslav is dead. Jelson saw to that. Which means the round is over and this is the point where I check for encounter groups being driven off. As we can see, the first zombie group has indeed been driven off. So we will remove that from the track and we will place a face down encounter card there. The second group is still at 50% strength, so that group does not get driven off. The third group is Gorslav. As Gorslav is dead, we replace that in counter card too. And then finally, we have the rats. There are still two thirds of the group on the board, so they aren't driven off. It's the end of the round. But just before we start this round, I should point out that having saved one of Dagnai's dice to become a reaction dice, having primed him to hit the rat as soon as it moved into the space next to him, I completely forgot to do it. We could have actually killed that rat before it attacked us, but as it didn't do any damage when it attacked us anyway, no harm, no foul. Not the first time I have forgotten I have reaction dice I can use, won't be the last. But let's start our new turn. We advance the Sun Tracker. Roll for destiny. And that's three threes we have to get rid of. We'll make our activation rolls and then lay out the initiative track. We do have some enemies activating before us at the start of this round. We will look at dealing with that in a moment. However, before we do that, Cleona Zeitengale is going to discard an activation dice she rolled that has a value of three because we discarded threes from the destiny dice roll. That will give her a third inspiration point and she will inspire. So we go from this to this. And now we have to think about gambits. It's not the end of the world that the rats are going to activate first because they do have to get through Dagni, but Cleona is going to use one of her activation dice to make a gambit roll. We will discard an activation dice with a value of one, and then we get to make an agility roll. Unfortunately, our agility is just a d6 combat dice. If we roll a success, we can swap places with the closest enemy on the track. If we roll a critical success, we can swap places with any enemy on the track. So we really want a critical success here. And it is a critical success. That's unbelievable. So Cleona is going to swap places on the activation track with the rats. And then Emil de Braskov is going to swap places with Dagni. So Dagni will activate before she does. Finally, Jelson is going to discard an activation dice with a value of two as well, because he is positioned on the track ahead of two groups that haven't turned up on the board yet. And it would be quite nice if we could activate after those groups so we have a chance to reposition ourselves based on where they arrive. Jelson's agility is a d8. And he has also rolled a critical success so he can reposition himself anywhere he likes. But we're just going to swap places with encounter group three. I don't really want two encounter groups activating before I do, but I would like one to activate so I can see where they turn up. We are done with gambits, so it's time to start our activations with Cleona. Although it may not look like it, Cleona has line of sight to the group of rats that is attacking Dagni. So we are going to use our Heaven's Bolt stilettos to attack those rats because then we will stun them and they will not be able to attack Dagni. And now, because we are inspired, this attack rolls a d12. It's a regular hit that inflicts a single wound on the rats, but the rats are stunned. Cleona only has a single activation dice left, but there are a couple of destiny dice. I'm going to discard a destiny dice with a value of five to use Heaven's Bolt Stilettos on the zombie. And that's a critical success. That's two wounds, and this time the zombie does die. I have one dice left, I could use it to move. I think I'm safe for where I am for now though because we don't know where those reinforcements are going to come in. So unfortunately, because the dice I have left has a value of one, when it is downgraded to a reaction dice, it is discarded. The last thing to do is roll for inspiration. A three or less will do it. Nope. Next up is group two, they are dead. Next to activate is group four, which is the rats. We have rolled a three. That removes all wounds from the rats and then they make an advance action. So in this case, the wound that we had inflicted on the stunned rats is removed. The stunned rats stand back up. The other rat swarm could move, but the only place they can move would leave them further away from the closest hero than they already are. So they just stand still. Dagni has successfully created a bottleneck that prevents them from harming us. And now Dagni gets to activate. He's going to start by discarding a four in order to make an attack with his ax. 
That's a regular hit, that's two wounds, not enough to kill the rat. So we'll go again. And that is a critical success, that does kill the rats. We will now discard a dice with a value of six in order to shoot the rats with our harpoon gun. That's a critical hit, that's three wounds, that kills that rat swarm too. Leaving us with one dice which we will keep as a reaction dice, just in case some enemies spawn at the gate we're standing next to. Next up to activate is Braskov. She is going to use a dice with a value of three to run. She will then use a dice with a value of two to move. She will then use her dice with a value of five to search the mysterious object. We have found a Vitalixer. When this treasure card is used, remove one disease token from this hero or prevent this hero from being diseased, then discard this card. And we remove the object because we have searched it. We are now going to use our last destiny dice, which has a value of one to move again. And then we will downgrade our last dice to a reaction dice with a value of two. We now get to encounter group three, which means we flip over their cards and three of the Ulfen Watch will arrive. We are going to spawn a Sergeant, a Banner Bearer, and a regular Grunt. And of course, we roll to see where they randomly appear. We have rolled a three, so they are actually going to appear right next to where Braskov is. They appear one at a time, making an advance action as they do so. We will start with the arrival of the Grunt. He will advance adjacent to Braskov, and then he will attack. However, Braskov has a reaction dice left, which means as soon as that enemy finishes its move action adjacent to her, she gets to spend that dice to hit it first. Let's see how that works out. It moves adjacent. We swing our Dawn Light with a d12, and we completely miss. That means the Grunt now gets to attack us as normal. And Ulfen Watch Skeletons roll 2d6. And it's a double blank. That's no damage on Braskov. Our luck is really holding out at the moment. But now the second skeleton arrives. We will have the sergeant turn up. He will advance and attack Braskov again. And Braskov does not have any reaction dice left now. Sergeant still only rolled 2d6 when attacking. And that is a hit. That's a regular hit that will inflict one wound. Unless Braskov can defend it, she gets to roll a d8 in defense. And she doesn't, so she takes a wound. That means next turn she will only be rolling three activation dice instead of four. And we still have one more skeleton to arrive. It's the banner bearer, who is just going to stand by the doorway. They have nothing else they can do. That finishes that particular activation. Next up to activate is Jelson Darak. Jelson has line of sight to all of those skeletons because two of them are in the same room as him and one is adjacent to a doorway to the room he is in. But we are, of course, going to target the sergeant with our judgment rifle. We discard a dice with a value of five. We are rolling 2d8. It's a double miss. That's annoying, but it's not the end of the world. We're going to spend a dice with a value of two to move. We have one activation dice left. We are going to use our ardent blade to attack the sergeant. If we roll a critical success, we will kill the sergeant, which will grant us a victory point and an inspiration point, which means Jelson will inspire as well. Um, we miss again. It was worth a shot. Unfortunately, Jelson has failed to achieve anything on his turn there. And now we have encounter group one to deal with. That's another reinforcement. And we have three more corpse rats to deal with. Where will they arrive? They will arrive in turn, making an advance action of three spaces. And of course, one of them is a blood rat another opportunity for a victory point. But that is the end of the round, so we will be checking for Driven Off again, and we can see Encounter Group 2 and 4 have been wiped out, so those will need to be replaced. And of course we have to remember our event roll. That is our time grows short again, so we advance the Daylight Tracker again. We now start a new turn. We advance the Daylight Tracker. Night is going to fall very soon, I think. We roll for Destiny. That's a 1, a 3, a 4, a 5, and a 6. That's a great dice roll. Then we roll our activation dice and set up the initiative track. And it's a bad start for us because the Ulfen Watch are going to activate immediately. So we're going to try and rearrange this track. First of all, I think Cleona is going to discard one dice with a value of 2 to try and do a gambit roll. That's a critical success. That's actually brilliant because she was last in the track and I can now move her to first in the track replacing the Olfen Watch, which means the Olfen Watch will now activate last. Furthermore, I can now use Braskov's action to swap places with Cleona, so Braskov will activate first. And suddenly, 
the whole nature of the battle has completely changed. The heroes are on the front foot. I could do some more gambits at this point, but I think I'm just going to leave it at that for now. We're just going to try and uh, do the best we can before the enemies start to activate. Braskoff will start by discarding a dice with a value of 6 in order to do a death blow on the two Ulfram Watch immediately adjacent to her. This first strike is on the Sergeant. It's a regular strike, that's two wounds, not enough to kill the Sergeant. Second strike on the regular Grunt. That's a success, that's two wounds, that is enough to kill the regular Grunt. We are now going to use our dice with a value of two to make another attack on the Sergeant. We miss again, okay, that's fine. We are going to use a Destiny dice with a value of one to hit him again. And we miss again. Uh, we will use a Destiny dice with a value of three to attack again. And this time it's a critical hit, that's four wounds. We kill the Sergeant and that does grant us a victory point. We have one dice left, it's a value of four. We're going to discard it in order to make a recuperate action. When we do a recuperate action, we roll a dice equal to our vitality stat. On a success, we can recover a wound. On a critical success, we can recover two wounds. Not this time, still wounded. However, we did kill enemies with a total wounds value of five, so we get to make an inspiration roll. And we roll a 12, not a chance. Next up is Jelson Darrick. Jelson wants to deal with some rats. So he will discard his dice with a value of one to move. He will then discard his dice with a value of six to use his judgment rifle. And of course we are shooting at the blood rat, which has four wounds. We only get a regular hit. That inflicts two wounds, not enough for a kill. But I think we will push our luck a little bit. We will use a destiny dice with a value of four to move. We will then use one of our dice with a value of five to hit the blood rat with our sword. That's a success, that's two wounds, that kills the blood rat. That's good news for us because that's another victory point. We will use our last six to hit another group of rats. It's a regular hit, that's two wounds, not enough to kill the rats. And for that reason, I will discard another destiny dice with a value of five to have one more crack at those rats just so I don't have to take as many attacks when they activate. But we miss, the rats are going to stay on the board, we are going to face a couple of attacks now. On the plus side, Jelson Darrick's path to glory is Relentless Hunter. Every time he kills a champion, he gains an inspiration point, so the fact he killed the blood rat means he does get an inspiration point, and he will inspire, switching to his inspired side of the card. Plus, we get to roll for inspiration as well. A four or less will do it. Nope. And now we activate group two on the initiative tracker. We have to flip over the encounter card, and it is a Kosagi night guard. Let's see where he turns up. He is turning up at seven, that's in the bottom right corner. That's really good news for us because he's well out of the way. He immediately makes an advance action, moving three spaces. Now group one activates, that is the corpse rats. They have rolled a five. So first of all, the rat swarm that we attacked completely heals up. And then both swarms will attack Jelson Darrick. Corpse rats roll a single d6 combat dice each, so I'm going to roll the attacks together. And it's a double miss. That's really good luck for us. Next up, Cleona activates. She only has three dice because she gave up one of her dice in order to do a gambit. But we are going to use a five to run. We are then going to use a six to cast Staff of Celestial Devastation on the Banner Bearer. We roll the d12 combat dice. If we get a success or a critical success, then the Banner Bearer takes three wounds. And it's a critical success. We emulate the Banner Bearer. We have one dice left with a value of six. We're going to downgrade it to a reaction dice and sit on it just to see what happens later in the round. Next up is Encounter Group 4. Let's reveal their card. That's two Ulfram Watch. We cannot use any of the Ulfram Watch miniatures that are on the other encounter card on the initiative track, so this time it will just be two regular grunts. These little twinsies are going to appear down next to the Kosagi Night Guard and make a regular advance action. They are heading towards Dagnai because he is the closest target. Speaking of which, it is Dagnai's turn to activate. Dagnai really doesn't fancy taking on all of these enemies at once, but it would be nice to put some damage on that Kosagi, so we're going to spend an activation dice with a value of four to move. 
We'll then use a dice with a value of 5 to hit the Kosagi with our axe. It's a miss. So we will discard the dice with a value of 5 to try again. This time it's a critical hit. That would normally inflict 3 wounds, but Kosagi have a special ability. They have Deathly Vigor. Every time they take damage, you roll a dice. On a 10 or more, you reduce the damage by 2 to a minimum of 1. So we could deflect 2 points of the 3 points of damage that Dagnai has just inflicted. But we do not. That's 3 points of damage on the Kosagi. He still has 7 left. We are going to change tact a little bit. We have one activation dice left and one destiny dice. We are going to use our last activation dice to hit one of the skeletons instead. Just because that way we might get to roll for some inspiration. A success will be enough. And we do get a success, so we kill one skeleton. We are then going to use our last destiny dice to retreat back into that narrow tunnel. We don't want to take attacks from the skeletons and the Kosagi at the same time. Finally, group three would activate, but group three has been wiped out. So we now check to see who has been driven off. We can see that only group three has been driven off, so we replace their card. And then we roll for our event. It's a two, which means Will of the Master. The group of enemies that is furthest from the heroes gets to make a move action. When there's a choice, we can pick. We are obviously going to pick that solitary skeleton to make a move action. It's a bit of a rubbish event that the monsters don't even get to attack, they just move. But nevertheless, that is the end of the round. It is a new round, but I did forget to roll for Dagnai's inspiration last turn, so I'm just going to do that now. No, he needed a two or less. So he still hasn't inspired. Now we advance the day tracker and roll for destiny. We have a disco dice. We have to discard the fives and the ones, leaving us with just a two this turn. Then we have to roll our activation dice and lay out the new initiative order. And we have a lot of enemy activations happening first. But I think we will start by using one of Jelson's activation dice to try and perform a gambit. Because I would like to see him activating before the rats. Fortunately, because we have inspired, our agility is now a d12 combat dice. And we have rolled a success. That allows us to swap places with the closest enemy on the track. Which means we will activate now before the rats do. And I think, because I don't have a lot of destiny dice to work with, I'm going to leave it at that. So gambits are over and we go into the activation phase. The first group to activate will be the face down encounter card. That's group three. We have two fresh Deadwalker zombies. And they are arriving at 12. That's right in the center of the board, right next to Cleona and Dagnai. They immediately make an advance action and they will move towards the closest hero. In this case, both Cleona and Dagnai are equal distance away, so we get to pick. We are obviously going to pick for them to attack Dagnai because he is our tank. Zombies roll the d8 combat dice, I will roll them both together. That's one miss, but one critical hit. Dagnai now has to defend. And he does not, he takes two wounds from that attack. And because he hasn't activated this turn yet, and he has a full complement of activation dice on his activation slots, we have to actually discard one of our dice in order to place that Grievous Wound. So we will remove our dice with a value of 1, and replace it with a Grievous Wound counter. And just as a reminder, there are wounds and Grievous Wounds in this game. Grievous Wounds are basically just two wounds. We can still heal those during the course of the game. But until we do, Dagnai is now only rolling three activation dice per turn. Next up to activate is Group 4, and Group 4 is that Ulfram Watch Skeleton. We roll for the Skeleton's activation. It's an 8. That's a charge, which means it will stay exactly where it is and attack Dagnai. An attack from a Skeleton is 2d6 combat dice. And it's another critical hit, forcing Dagnai to make another save. If he fails this, he will pick up another two wounds. That's equal to another Grievous Wound on his character sheet, which means he will lose another dice and will only have two activation dice in future. We roll a success. When you roll a success when defending, you reduce the incoming damage by one. That means we still take one point of damage, we still have to lose another activation dice, and we will still only be rolling two dice next turn. Dagnai's abilities as a tank are coming into question. Next up to activate is Jelson Darak. He only has three dice because he made a gambit roll, but we will start by discarding a dice with a value of two to attack one of these corpse rats. Because we have inspired, this attack is now 2d8 combat dice. 
It's a miss, but we will go again. This time it's a regular hit, that's two wounds, not enough to kill the rats. But we will go again. Looking for a success here. That's a success, that does kill one of the groups of rats. There is one destiny dice on the track with a value of two. I am going to use it to attack the rats again, because if I get a critical success, I will inflict four wounds and kill the second group of rats. But it's a complete miss, that's a waste. Unfortunately, that ends our turn. We do get to roll for inspiration. A three or less will grant us an inspiration point. And we roll a one, that's fantastic. We do get an inspiration point. But next up in the initiative track is the Rat Swarm. It's a four, they would heal any damage and then make a regular attack. It's a 1d6 combat dice. And it's a miss. Things are still kind of going okay. But next it is Dagnai's turn to activate. Dagnai, of course, has picked up a couple of wounds. You can see on his character sheet, we have one Grievous Wound over the first slot. That was from the first two wounds that the zombies inflicted. And then we have a regular wound over the second activation slot, which was inflicted by the skeleton. We are going to try and recover some of those wounds now. We're going to spend a dice with a value of four to make a recuperate roll. When you make a recuperate roll, you roll the dice listed for your vitality. In this case, a D8 combat dice. And that's nothing. That's not great. But we do have an inspiration point. It would be great to save that inspiration point so that we could eventually inspire, but we've taken some damage and I'm not happy about that. We're going to spend our inspiration point instead to re-roll this dice. And it's still nothing. Not ideal, but we have one dice left. We're going to make another recuperate action. Really looking for a critical here. And there it is, that's a critical. When you roll a critical on your recuperation roll, you can remove two regular wounds or one grievous wound. So we will remove the grievous wound, and that means next turn we are back to rolling three activation dice again. But unfortunately, that's all Dag and I can do this turn, and he lost his inspiration point. Next up is Braskov, who is also carrying a wound, but we want to go and try and kill some zombies. So we're going to spend our dice with a value of one to move, we will then use our dice with a value of two to attack. That's a regular hit, that's two wounds, not enough to kill a zombie. But we do have one dice left, we are going to use it to attack again. And it's a miss, things have started to take a turn. I could spend an inspiration point to try again, but I still have Cleona to activate, so it's not the end of the world just yet. Next to activate is our Kosagi Night Guard. He rolls an eight. He will make a charge action, but fortunately there's a skeleton in the way of getting to Dagnai. So all he's going to do is approach as close as he can. Finally, Cleona will activate. She will discard a dice with a value of two to move. And we're moving her to there because we do not want to stand next to that Lich Gate in case anything spawns there. Next, we discard a dice with a value of three to hit the wounded zombie. It's a regular hit, that's two wounds. We do kill the zombie. We will discard another dice to have another go. Looking for a critical to one-shot this zombie. And there it is, a critical on our D6. They may not have lasted long, but they did do some damage to Dagnai. I have one dice left, it's a value of three. I'm going to use that to use my Heaven's Bolt stilettos on the skeleton that is adjacent to Dagnai. I can see that skeleton because it is standing next to the doorway to the room that I am in. A crit will kill it, a success will stun it. And it's a crit, that's amazing, we have killed the skeleton. Unfortunately, that does clear the way for the Kosagi to come and say hello. That was a pretty amazing turn for Cleona because she has killed six points worth of zombies and two points worth of skeletons. So an eight or less on the inspiration roll will grant her an inspiration point. She gets a four, so she gets an inspiration point. All of the activations are complete, so we check for being driven off. First up are the corpse rats. They are down to a third or fewer of their original number, so the final stand of rats is removed from play. As they go, they get to make that attack roll. And it is a success on Jelson Darek. Darek gets to defend with a d8. And he does not, so he takes a wound, so we'll only roll three activation dice next turn all of the heroes are starting to pick up some niggling injuries now. Next up, we have the Deadwalkers. They have been completely wiped out, so we just replace their card. And then same again for the Skeletons. Finally, we roll for an event. It's a four. 
which activates the enemy group furthest from the heroes. The Kosagi Night Guard lumbers up to engage with Dagnai. Who else hears boss music as this turn ends? A new turn starts, we advance the Daylight Tracker and we roll our Destiny Dice. And we have to discard those twos, but we get a one, a four, and a five. We will now roll all of our activation dice. Dag Knight, Jelson, and Braskov all have one wound, so only roll three dice each. And of course, we will also put out our initiative cards. And we have what we in the business call a problem. Because you can see we have a lot of enemies activating before our heroes. And Dag Knight, who is face to face with a Kosagi Night Guard, is actually at the very end of the track. We can do something about that though. First of all, Braskov is going to use her ability to swap places with Dagnai. That way, Dagnai will activate before the Kosagi Night Guard does. Beyond that, I think we are going to leave things as they are. The reason being, the other enemies aren't on the board yet. They will spawn at different points and then they will activate with a regular advance. By having most of our heroes activating later in the turn, it gives us more of a chance to respond to however they spawn. So we will leave things as they are and we will go into the activation round starting with Encounter Group 3 which is a face down card that we have to reveal. It's Watch Captain Halgrim. We roll an 8 which means he will appear in the bottom right corner where the Kosagi Night Guard appeared from. He will then make a regular advance moving 3 spaces. Next up Dagnai will activate. Dagnai wants to do a couple of things. He wants to recuperate if he can but he also wants to put some damage on this Night Guard. So first of all, we will discard a dice with a value of six to hit the Night Guard with our axe. It's a miss and we don't have any inspiration points, but we do have another dice with a value of six, so we will try again. That's a regular hit causing two points of damage. The Night Guard gets to roll for defense. A 10 or more will reduce that damage to just one. But we roll a three, so that's two more points of damage on the Kosagi. These big lads get 10 wounds each, so they really are tough to take down, but I'm going to use my last dice with a value of one to attack again. And that is a critical hit, so that will be three points of damage unless the Kosagi can soak some of it. And it doesn't, it takes another three wounds. It's on eight wounds, I think. Dagnai is now going to use a destiny dice with a value of four in order to make a recuperate roll. We want to try and get our wounds back and we fail. We have one more destiny dice that we can use. We can either use it to make an attack on the Kosagi. If we hit and the Kosagi doesn't block the damage, then we have killed it. If we miss, the Kosagi is going to activate in a moment and hit us. Alternatively, we can use our destiny dice to try and make another recuperate action. A Kosagi can inflict up to four wounds with a single hit, which would mean we would only roll one activation dice next turn. So I think we're going to do another recuperate action. We'll spend a destiny dice with a value of five to try and recuperate again. And we don't. This has gone badly for us. Should have gone for the attack. Should have been bold. Never mind. Next up, group four activates, which means we reveal the face down encounter card. And it's too old from watch. We can now spawn a sergeant and a banner bearer, and they will benefit from having Halgrim on the board as well. Let's see where they turn up. It's a five, that puts them up in the top corner where Dagnai Holden Stock's character card is. And they will both now make a regular advance action towards the closest hero. The closest hero is Braskov, so they head that away. And now our Kosagi activates. He rolls a three. That means he's going to stay exactly where he is and hit Dagnai as hard as he can. 2d8 for this. It's a regular hit that will inflict three wounds, but Dagnai does get a chance to save with a D12 red combat dice. We roll a regular success, which reduces the incoming damage by one. That means we take two wounds. So the wound we already have converts into a grievous wound, and then we take a second regular wound. Dagnai is not having the best time. But now Cleona activates. Cleona rolled absolute garbage on her activation roll but she does have one three that she can use for Heaven's Bolt Stilettos to target the Kosagi Night Guard. If we hit, then we have stunned it. And that is a critical hit. That inflicts two wounds. If the Kosagi cannot block at least one point of the damage, then the Kosagi dies. 
and it rolls a 12. It deflects one point of the damage. One point of damage gets through, and that means the Kosagi is still alive with a single wound remaining. But he is stunned, which means we don't really have to worry about him much more. Cleona has three dice left, and there is one Destiny dice left as well. I think we're going to push our luck. We're going to go and try and knock in some skulls. We will use a dice with a value of one to move. We will use a Destiny dice with a value of one to move. We will then use a dice with a value of two to use our thrice blessed mace to attack the sergeant. That's a critical hit. That's three wounds. That kills the sergeant. And of course, the sergeant is a champion, so that grants us our fifth victory point. And we have one dice left, so we're going to use that as well to attack the remaining banner bearer. That's a regular hit. That is two wounds. That kills the banner bearer as well. Nice work from Cleona. That's five points worth of monsters killed, so an inspiration roll of five or less will grant her an inspiration point. She rolls a three, so that is another inspiration point. Next up to activate is Jelson Darak. First of all, we'll use a dice with a value of one to make a recuperate action. That is a success that heals one wound. We will then use a dice with a value of one to move, and then we will downgrade our last dice to a one to keep as a reaction dice, just in case. Next up on the initiative track is group one, so we reveal their card. It's another three Ulfen Watch, but we cannot spawn a sergeant or a banner bearer, so it's just three regulars. And they are turning up at spawn point 10, that is bottom left. So they will spawn in that bottom corner and then they all advance three spaces, positioning themselves nicely for Braskov to go and have a chat. Braskov discards a two to move. She's going to discard a six to do death blow. Anything but a blank will kill a skeleton. That's one, that's a kill. Second attack. That's a blank, so that's a miss. But we have one dice remaining, we have a five. We will use that to attack again. And that is a critical hit, so that kills a second skeleton. Unfortunately, Braskov only killed two enemies. If she had killed three, she would have got an inspiration point and inspired. However, she does still get to roll. A four or less will grant her the inspiration point she needs to go up to an inspired form. It's a six, still not enough. She still hasn't inspired. That's the end of the activation, so we check for groups that have been driven off. Those newly arrived skeletons that Braskov were fighting are driven off. The final skeleton will be removed from the board, but we'll get to make an attack first. But it misses. We now remove it from the board, we remove the encounter card from the track, and we replace it with a face down card. The Kosagi and Watchmaster Halgrim are fine, so next up, we have to drive off the other group of Olfen Watch. Finally, we roll for an event. It's a two. That is the Will of the Master, which gives a move action to the enemy units furthest away from the heroes. So Halgrim will advance up behind the Kosagi Night Guard. The Daylight Tracker marches on and we roll for Destiny. That's a whole bunch of sixes that we have to discard, but we get to keep the one and the four. Next, we will roll our activation dice and lay out the initiative track. And in the initiative order, there will be an enemy group activating first, then Dagnai, then the Kosagi. That actually works out quite nicely for us because it gives Dagnai a chance to kill that Kosagi before it can get back into the action. The only concern I have is that Watchmaster Halgrim is there. So I do think I'm going to spend one of Jelson Darak's activation dice in order to make a gambit roll in the hope that I can swap places with him. My agility is a d12 combat dice. But I fail, which means I cannot move on the track. We will try and do the same thing with Braskov using a dice with a value of three. My agility here is only a d6 though. But that was also a miss. I'm gonna just have to suck it up. We're just gonna have to leave things as they are and see what happens. I can't afford to use any more dice at the moment. Not until at least Dagnai has healed up a little bit. So we reveal the first encounter card. Three zombies have come to play. And they are going to spawn right next to Cleona, which means she's about to take three attacks from zombies. Zombies attack with a D8, so that's three attacks to deal with. That's one critical. Just one critical, so we need to roll for a defense against that one critical. Our defense is just a D6. And we don't make it. A critical hit from a zombie inflicts two damage, so Cleona Zeitingale takes one grievous wound on her character sheet. And that forces us to discard a dice with a value of two. Next up, it's Dagnai, 
and Dagnai needs to kill this Night Guard. He will start by using his dice with a value of 3, just to make a regular attack. And it's a critical success, that's 3 wounds. Regardless of what happens, the Kosagi always takes 1 damage when you hit it, and as the Kosagi only has 1 wound left, there's nothing it can do, it cannot soak that damage, and it does die. That grants us a victory point, and we can breathe a sigh of relief. That's 6 victory points total so far for anybody keeping track. Dagnai is now going to use one of the Destiny dice with a value of 1 to make a Vitality roll. Nothing. Okay, he's now going to use another Destiny dice with a value of 4 to try and make another Vitality roll. That's a success, that heals one of our wounds. But I guess we will use our last 5 to roll again. Looking for a critical here. That is not a critical. Dagnai has basically stood in this tunnel for the whole game, bleeding out. Next up to activate would be our Kosagi, but he's a bit dead now. But next up is Watch Captain Halgrim. We roll a 7. We have rolled a disciplined advance. This hostile makes an advance action, then all Ulfen Watch on the battlefield make an advance action. We are very, very lucky there are no Ulfen Watch on the board right now. Especially as while Halgrim is on the board, all Ulfen Watch units get to add plus one damage to their weapon actions. Still, Dagnai is going to face an attack from Halgrim. 2d8 for this. And it's a critical hit. Halgrim inflicts four wounds on a critical hit. So whatever happens next, we are going to take one wound, but hopefully we can roll a critical success to reduce the total damage by three. And there it is, that's a critical success. That was massive for us. If we hadn't succeeded in that roll, we would have taken four wounds. That's two more Grievous wounds on our character card. We would have been rolling one activation dice next turn. As it is, we reduce the total damage by three. We take one regular wound and Dagnai continues to slowly bleed out. Next up is Cleona. She's got a problem too. Cleona only has three activation dice. She's going to use them to start hitting zombies. We discard our three to use our thrice blessed mace. A critical success will instantly kill a zombie. That's just a regular hit, that's two wounds. So we shall go again. That's a critical, that kills that zombie. We have one more dice, I think we are going to have to roll for a recuperation and rely on Jelson Darak to kill the other zombies for us. We roll a d8. And that's a critical success, that heals two wounds, so we get to remove the Grievous Wound from our character card. That was really important. But that does end our activation. We have to roll for Inspiration. A three or less will grant us an Inspiration point. We got a four, not enough. However, I have also just remembered I did not roll to see if Dagnai got an Inspiration point for killing the Kosagi Night Guard. Remember, Kosagi have ten wounds, so a ten or less will grant us an Inspiration point. Just, just made it. Next up to activate is Jelson Darak. He is going to use one dice to move up to the zombies. He will then use a dice with a value of four to attack. That's a complete miss, but we do have an inspiration point. I think we're going to use it just to get a reroll on one of these dice. That's a critical hit. That inflicts four points of damage. That kills a zombie. We have one dice left. We will attack again. And that's a critical hit as well. That is another dead zombie. We are out of activations, but we do get to roll for inspiration. Six or less will get us an inspiration point. It's a 12, so that's no good for us. Next up to activate is Braskov. Unfortunately, she cannot get into Halgrim to fight, so she's going to use her dice with a value of four to do a recuperate action. That's no good, so we may as well use our five as well to try again. And that is also no good. Next up, our fourth encounter group activates and we reveal what it is. It's a swarm of bats. And they arrive in the bottom right corner. And when they arrive, they take an advance action which allows them to move five spaces. That gives them a choice of going towards Dagnai or Cleona. Because Dagnai has his hands full, we're going to move towards Cleona instead. So after spawning and advancing, they will end up there. It is worth noting there is a big bat there. That is a champion. That's a dire bat. If we kill that, that's another victory point for us. We have finished our activations, so we check for who has been driven off. You can see that the first two encounter cards need to be replaced. These are the last two encounter cards in the deck, so next time we will have to reshuffle the deck and start again. And we must not forget our event. That's a nine. 
And that's amazing because we can pick one of our heroes on the board to make a free recuperate action. Obviously, we're going to select Dagnai, who gets to roll 1d8. And he gets a critical success that allows him to remove the Grievous Wound from his character card. He has only one wound left on his character sheet, which of course means we can roll three activation dice next turn. Speaking of which, it's the next turn. The Day Tracker advances, next turn, Night will descend. And at that point, all the enemies get tougher. We now roll for Destiny. And we have to discard the fives and the ones, leaving us with just a two. We then roll our activation dice and lay out the initiative track. And this is an amazingly good order for us because we get to do a lot of stuff before the enemies activate. I'm not going to make any gambits this turn. I'm going to make full use of my dice to try and clear the board. First up, Jelson. He's going to start by discarding a dice with a value of six to shoot his judgment rifle at the dire bat. It's a complete fluff. Never mind, we will use our dice with a value of 1 to move. We will then use our dice with a value of 5 in order to attack with our Ardent Blade. Again, we are attacking the Diabat. It's another miss. We have one dice left, we're going to use that too. That's a regular hit. That will inflict two wounds, which won't be enough to kill the bats. Plus, bats get a defense roll. If they roll a 10 or more, they reduce the damage by 2 to a minimum of 1. But no, that's a three, so the bat takes two wounds. There is one destiny dice with a value of two. I'm going to use that as well because I really want to kill this bat. But we miss again. Jelson is having a shocker. He doesn't even have any inspiration points to spend. His turn ends. Next up is Cleona. She's going to discard a dice with a value of one to move. We are going to hit the bat with our thrice blessed mace. That's a critical hit. That's three wounds. As that bat has already taken two wounds, it cannot soak enough damage to prevent its death. It is removed from play. We have two more dice. We're going to use those to try and remove the other bats as well. So we discard our dice with a value of two. That's a regular hit. That's two wounds. The bat does get a saving roll. Which it fails. That bat dies as well. One bat left, one dice left. That's a regular hit. That's another two wounds. Will the bat defend it? And it does. It only takes one wound, so it is still in play. Unfortunately, there's nothing I can do about that. It's the end of Cleona's turn. We do get to roll for inspiration. Five or less will do it. And that's a one. Not a bad turn from Cleona there. Just a shame we couldn't kill that final bat. Next up to activate is Dagnai. I think we'll start by using our dice with a value of six to hit Halgrim. Dagnai is clearly not much of a tactician beyond standing in doorway, hitting things with axe. But he does hit, that is two wounds on Halgrim. Let's go again. That's a critical hit, that's three wounds, that puts him on five. Halgrim has two wounds remaining. I could kill him with my final dice, but it's an all or nothing roll. I would rather use my last dice to move back to let Braskov come in on her activation and finish the job. So I will move back to there. Unfortunately, no inspiration roll for Dagnai because he didn't kill anything. And now, encounter group two reveals. It's another bat swarm. And they are arriving in the bottom left corner. And they will immediately activate, immediately take an advance action and swarm on Braskov. And once again, one of these bats is a dire bat, another potential victory point for us. So that's where they end up after their advance action. And now I have to face a whole bunch of attacks. Each bat rolls a d6. That's a miss. That's a miss. And that's a miss. We can breathe again. Now Braskov activates. And it goes without saying, the bats have thrown something of a spanner in the works. Because I don't really want them flying around any more than I want Halgrim hanging about. And I do have a six, which will allow me to do a death blow. So that's what I'm going to do first. I'm going to discard my six to do a death blow, targeting first the dire bat and then one of the other swarms in the dire bat space. First attack. That's a critical hit. That's four wounds, but the bat does get a save. Which it doesn't make. We have killed the dire bat. That's our eighth victory point. And now our second attack. That's a miss. Do I spend an inspiration point to re-roll it? Yeah, why not? That's a critical hit. That's another four points of damage. The bat would get to defend, but unfortunately for the bat, 
Even a successful defense roll only reduces the damage by two, which means two points of damage still gets through and bats only have two wounds each. So that is another kill for Braskov. An inspiration point well spent, I think. We are now going to use a two to move across to Halgrim and we are going to use our final two to attack him. Any kind of hit is enough to kill him. And we rolled a critical hit, that's massive. That's four points of damage. Halgrim takes a dirt nap. Braskov is back in business because that is another victory point for us. We are on nine. This is good news all round for us because first of all, Braskov killed three enemies, which means she automatically gets an inspiration point. Furthermore, she killed Halgrim, who has seven wounds. She killed a dire bat that has three wounds and she killed a regular bat swarm that has two wounds. That's a total of 12 wounds. So she will get another inspiration point as well because you can only roll 12 or less on a D12. That's two inspiration points for her, which means she will inspire. That takes her from this to this. Next up to activate is the bat swarm in the top right corner. We have rolled an eight. An eight is a blinding attack. Each acting hostile makes an advance action. If the attack roll for the advance action's weapon action is successful, lower the scores of any remaining activation dice on the target's character card by one to a minimum of one. That's not a problem for us because we have already used all of our activation dice. The bats have a choice of which target to attack. In this situation, the leader would pick and obviously the leader would pick the character most likely to survive the attack. So we will pick Jelson Darak. It's a critical hit on Jelson. That inflicts two wounds, but we do get a D8 defense. And we rolled a critical defense. That means we block up to three points of damage. We're absolutely fine. Next up, we reveal group one. I know what it's going to be. It's going to be a vampire and it's going to be something that will grant us our final victory point we need. And we roll an eight, which means it arrives in the bottom right corner of the board. It then makes an advance action immediately, moving five spaces. Braskov can breathe a sigh of relief there. One space closer and that vampire would have been having lunch. The final group to activate would be Halgrim, but Halgrim is deceased. And now we roll for units being driven off. First of all, we have group two, which are the rats in the bottom left corner. They are not adjacent to any heroes, so they just flee the board. Next, we replace Halgrim's encounter card. Finally, we drive off the bats in the top right corner. The rats will attack Jelson Darak as they leave. It's a critical hit, we have to defend. Jelson fails his defense, so he takes two wounds. That's a grievous wound on his character card. And with that spiteful attack, the bats leave. That completes the round, so we roll for an event. We have rolled an eight, which advances the Sun Tracker. However, the Sun Tracker was going to hit the night space this turn anyway, so nothing too much to worry about. But indeed, night has fallen. All of the enemies now get tougher, and we do have a vampire on the board. So that's not great. So it's the start of the new turn and this sunlight tracker is now on the nightfall space. That means we don't have to worry about advancing it anymore. Trouble has already found us. And just to give you a hint of the kind of trouble I'm talking about, here we have the character sheet for the Viacos Bloodborne Vampires. When night falls, we turn the card over and we have an empowered side. This is kind of like when the heroes inspire, but you can see that the weapon action for the Vyarkos Bloodborne now goes up to 2d12 and it does three slash four damage. So that is a much more powerful attack. Other abilities will also get more powerful and they are more likely to do nasty things when you roll on the behavior table. Fortunately, we're nearly done. Let's roll for destiny dice. We have to get rid of those sixes, but we keep the two, the three, and the five. And then of course we roll our activation dice and we lay out the initiative track. And we have what we in the business of adventuring would call a problem because that Bloodborne Vampire is going to activate first and that's a real risk to Braskov. So let's see if maybe we can do something about that. First of all, Cleona is going to discard a dice with a value of one to make a gambit roll, which she fails. Not great. Next up, Jelson Darak will discard a dice with a value of four to try a gambit roll. He rolls a d12. But he also fails. If Amelda gets hit by the vampire, she's probably going to end up losing at least one activation dice anyway. So I think perhaps we will use one of her dice with a value of two to try once more with a gambit roll. She rolls a d6 for her agility. And she fails too. This is bad news for us the vampire is going to activate first. We roll a nine. 
And this is as bad as it gets, really. This is a bloodthirsty charge. Each acting hostile makes a charge action. Reroll failed attack rolls for that charge action. So the vampire will charge into Braskov, and then it attacks with 2d12. It's just a regular hit, but that is still a potential three wounds on Braskov. Next, we will roll for defense. We need a critical success here. And we do get it. That's a critical success. We negate all three points of damage. That's fantastic. Next up, we reveal group four. We have three more Olfen Watch to deal with. And it's a three. They are going to spawn next to Cleona. Things are about to get ugly. Remember, each skeleton arrives in turn and makes an advance action. So Cleona is going to be attacked three times. First, the banner bearer pops out, now rolling a d12. And it's a critical hit. That's two wounds. We do get a chance to defend. We do not succeed in our defense roll, but we have inspiration points. We're going to spend one to re-roll that dice. And that is a critical success. We deflect all that damage. That was well worth spending the inspiration point on. Unfortunately, we have two more skeletons arriving. Next, the sergeant appears. He joins the banner bearer, and because there is a banner bearer on the board, we get to re-roll failed attack dice with this sergeant now. But we get a success. That's two wounds. Cleona has to defend again. And again, she fails, but we do have more inspiration points. I think we should spend one here. But we still fail. That's two wounds. That's a grievous wound that gets added to our character card. And then our third skeleton appears and attacks Cleona again. Rolling a d12 and still getting a re-roll because of that banner. It's a success, that's two wounds. And we get a critical success on our saving throw. That's really good because we block all of the incoming damage. If we hadn't blocked it all, we would have lost one of our activation dice. That is really good stuff because it's now the end of that activation and Cleona gets to activate. Cleona has a chance to kill the sergeant scoring us our last victory point, and then we can make a dash for the exit. Cleona is going to try and wipe all of these skeletons with a single attack. First, she is going to use a destiny dice with a value of two to move away. She is then going to use her dice with a value of six to use the Staff of Celestial Devastation on the space where the banner bearer is standing. We now roll a d12 combat dice, and if we get a success or a critical success, the banner bearer and the sergeant both take three wounds. That will be enough to kill them both. And it is a critical success. So we kill both of those skeletons with a single attack. Furthermore, Celestial Devastation has a splash damage attack. All of the adjacent enemies and heroes will also take two points of damage if we roll a success on a D8. Fortunately, Jelson Darek is not in the blast radius, but the other skeleton is. Let's see if we can go three for three. We have failed, but we have one more inspiration point. Let's use it. Let's see if we can wipe this last skeleton. And there it is, that's a critical hit. All three skeletons are killed and removed from the board. Thankfully, Cleona had a lot of inspiration points this turn. She has two activation dice remaining. We can use them both to run because having killed that sergeant, we do now have 10 victory points. If we can get off the board, we have successfully completed this mission. So that's two dice, two run actions, that will cover eight squares. But that finishes our activation. But of course we have to roll for inspiration, a seven or less will do it. Not this time. Next up, encounter group two activates. Let's see what we've got. Two dead walker zombies join the battle. And they're going to turn up in the bottom right corner. That's fantastic because that's well away from us. I don't think we're gonna to have to worry about them. They will of course spawn and then move two spaces. And Jelson Darek is the closest hero, so they will head towards him, finishing just there. It is now Jelson's turn to activate. He doesn't want to worry about those zombies. Those zombies can be ignored. We want to head towards the exit. We are going to use a dice with a value of five to run, and then we will use a dice with a value of six to run. And that completes Jelson's activation. Next up is Braskov. She only has two dice. And we know better than to try to get into a fight with an empowered vampire. So we are going to use our dice with a value of three to run. We will then use our dice with a value of five to run. We will then use a destiny dice with a value of five to complete an extraction action. That will open the exit and place the extraction point. If we can get all of our heroes standing in the extraction point, we have won the game. 
that completes Braskov's turn. No inspiration roll for her. You don't get inspiration points for running away. But now the third encounter group is revealed. It's Gorslav, the Gravekeeper. He's back. He arrives at the top of the board and immediately advances three spaces. It is now Dagnai's turn to activate. Dagnai is going to use the last Destiny dice with a value of three to run. Unfortunately, his run is no faster than his walk. He only moves three squares. He will then discard a dice with a value of two to walk. He's going to use his dice with a value of four to search the object of interest. And he has found a realm stone. He's then going to use his final dice with a value of five to run into the extraction point. That way, if there's a horrible event and all of my other heroes get killed, which is just not going to happen, but if it did, at least I have completed the mission successfully because one of my heroes is on the extraction point. He goes into the extraction zone, and of course we remove the mysterious object because we searched it successfully. That completes Dagnai's turn. Next up, we have to see who gets driven off. It's obviously just this group of skeletons at the end of the track. And last of all, we roll for an event. That's a 10. When you roll a 10, you can pick any hero on the board to make a recuperation roll. And considering Cleona is the closest to being attacked by any of the other enemies, we're going to pick her. She gets to roll a d8 for her vitality check. Unfortunately, she rolls a blank. We are going into what will probably be the last turn of the game. All of my heroes are carrying wounds or grievous wounds, and each will only get to roll three activation dice, so we need a good roll on our destiny dice just to make sure we get out. Unfortunately, we get a bad roll. We have to discard the fives and twos. We keep one dice with a value of one. And then we will roll our activation dice and set up the initiative track. Well, that could have been better. Could have been worse. I think we're going to let it ride the way it is. I think if we start spending too many dice on gambits now, we may find ourselves running out. And I don't want to risk it when we are this close to escaping. So we're just going to let it go. The first group to activate is our group of Deadwalker zombies over in the bottom right. A seven is a charge, which means they will get to move twice. And because they are now empowered, zombies have a base move of four. So these zombies are going to move eight squares. However, before we do that, I have also just noticed a minor mistake from the previous turn. Although I say minor, it's not that minor. Gorslav used to have a move of three, but when he empowers, his movement goes up to four. That means he would have had enough movement to reach Cleona. So I'm just gonna move him one more space up and we are going to resolve a basic attack against Cleona, which we should have done in the previous turn. Gorslav rolls 2d8. It's a regular strike, which inflicts four wounds. Cleona does of course get a save, which she completely fluffs. That means she picks up another four wounds. That's two grievous wounds. And that means she will only have one activation dice this turn. Obviously at the start of this turn, I did roll three activation dice for her, but because of this serious injury from Gorslav, she should really only have rolled one activation dice. So I am going to remove two dice from her character sheet and then I will re-roll the final activation dice, just to be fair. Cleona is carrying three grievous wounds and is just highlighting how much more dangerous it becomes once night falls in Olfenkarn. Anyway, that little situation aside, we rolled a charge for our zombies so they will each move eight spaces. One of the things that has been said about this game is that very few of the enemies have any kind of ranged attacks and that's a problem. I don't think it is a problem because you're never very far away from the enemies. They really can close the distance on you. And things could potentially get worse for us right now because we have to spawn group four. We have two Olfen Watch skeletons. That will be a banner bearer and a sergeant. And they appear at six. That's the top right corner. They will then make a regular advance action, which is three spaces. We were lucky there. If we had rolled a one or two to see where they turned up, they would have been right on top of Braskov. We are also lucky because next to activate is Cleona. Cleona is obviously very, very badly beaten up. As you can see, she only has one dice left on her character sheet. The way that wounds work in this game, once you have filled up all of your activation slots, you're not out of the game, but you are very badly injured and you have to rely on destiny dice. Only if you have to place a wound on your character sheet and you have no slots left to fill, will your character be taken out of action. In other words, at this point, Cleona could still take another two wounds and carry on fighting, but we don't want to take that risk. We are going to use that four to run and we are going to hide in the extraction point. But that does end Cleona's activation. 
Next up, the vampire activates. We have rolled a one, that is a scent of blood. This is a basic charge action, except we have to prioritize characters that have taken wounds. The vampires are hunting down the scent of blood. Ultimately, it just means bad news for Jels and Darek, because a charging vampire moves 12 spaces. Once night falls, once the enemy's in power, there really are very few places to hide. And now this thing gets to attack with 2d12, but there is a critical hit there. That's four wounds on Jelson. Jelson's defense is a d8. And we don't save anything. That's another four wounds. That's two grievous wounds. We have to remove two of our activation dice. The problem now is Gorslav is going to activate two and he is absolutely going to end up hitting Jelson as well. Can Jelson survive? We have rolled a two. That is, arise, arise. Deploy all slain Deadwalker zombies from hostile groups as reinforcements. Then, this hostile and all Deadwalker zombies on the battlefield make an advance action. Jelson is in a world of pain, because first Gorslav will activate, then the Deadwalkers will activate, and they can all get in to attack him. First Gorslav. He attacks with 2d8. And it's a miss. That is huge. That has really, really helped. Unfortunately, the two zombies also activate and they can now move four spaces. That is enough to squeeze past the vampire and Gorslav and attack Jelson as well. Each zombie rolls a d8 to attack. Let's do them one at a time for drama. That's a hit. That's two points of damage. Jelson needs to roll a critical success to block this. And there it is. That's a critical success but there is still one more zombie attack. And it misses, it's missed. That is absolutely nail biting that situation because if it had hit, if we had failed our defense roll, we would have lost our last activation dice. Next up to activate is Braskov. She could, if she wanted to, charge into the fight, try and kill a couple of zombies, but there's actually no need because we have just by the skin of our teeth escaped this confrontation. We are going to use a dice with a value of five to run to the extraction point. Next up to activate would be Dagnai. Dagnai is just going to shuffle to the back of the extraction point to make room for Jelson. And finally, Jelson will activate. Now remember, Braskov did have activation dice that she could have used to go and attack the zombies. Maybe she could have killed them all and cleared the way, made things a little bit easier for Jelson but I had already worked out that Jelson had just enough activations to get out. So I left the board like this just to show you how close this situation is. Jelson has just one activation dice. It has a value of four and that will allow him to run. However, he's adjacent to a lot of enemies. And remember, as soon as you enter a space adjacent to an enemy, you have to end your current movement action. Fortunately, we also have one destiny dice, the only destiny dice we had this round, and it has a value of one. So first we're going to spend our destiny dice with a value of one to make a move action. We move to there, but we have to immediately stop because that square is diagonally adjacent to the two zombies. But now we have our final dice, our dice with a value of four. We can use that to move, and that does give us just enough movement to get into the extraction point. And that is the end of the round. We go to the event phase. Because all of our heroes are in the extraction point, there is no event phase. The mission is over. And this is a win, but only just. For the record, Dagnai had one wound. Jelson Darek was carrying three grievous wounds. Amelda Braskov was carrying a wound. And Cleona Zeitengale had three grievous wounds as well. We were very much crippled. A few more turns like that and it would have been game over for us. And indeed, Jelson was incredibly lucky in that final turn. A slightly different outcome to that combat with the zombies and he would have either been killed there and then or in such a position that he wouldn't have had enough movement to escape. But escape we did. This was a victory. We did kill 10 champions. We have reduced Radukar's influence in the city. We also picked up a treasure card and two realm stones and two realm stones is just enough to buy one of the weakest empowerments. 
This has been tense. This really has been a closely fought battle. It started off our way. Gradually, you can see the wounds start to accumulate. If you don't control those wounds, over time you become less and less efficient. And it did get to a situation where quite often I was only rolling three dice for my heroes instead of four. That meant I started taking a little bit longer. The daylight tracker caught up with us, night fell, and suddenly all hell broke loose. We suddenly had super powerful villains on the board, a very, very angry vampire, and Gorslav came back to have a word with us because he wasn't too happy about how we treated him at the very start of the game. But we made it. We did make it out alive. Just. Remember, any hero who falls in battle, they may not necessarily be dead. You have to make a roll for them after the mission. But it's always a nerve-wracking roll, and you really want to avoid making them, if at all possible. But I think I have been talking for long enough. I hope that you have found this playthrough interesting. If you have liked the video, please consider pressing the like button. If you've really liked the video, please consider subscribing if you don't already do so. And hopefully, I will see you all again very soon. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.